Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this latest teaching session in the course on technology and the future of medicine. Today, Dr. Earl Waugh is taking us through evil as a treatable disease. But before we talk about that, I'm sure you're very excited to hear the latest updates about future day, March 1st, Saturday, March 1st. So uh, Mallory Chipman, who is Tommy Banks' granddaughter, is uh, going to give two 20-minute sets. She will sing a combination of Leonard Cohen music and jazz and folk music. And I've given her complete freedom. She can sing what she wants. And uh, so then uh, something very exciting. Many of you may wonder about the medical student participation in this course. William Parker is one of the medical students taking this course is going to present his uh, presentation for the course that evening on uh, has the world of Star Trek already uh, come to pass? Uh, he's going to talk about the um, Tricorder uh, X Prize, kind of uh, uh, the doctor in your cell phone. Um, so he will give his 20-minute uh, presentation that evening. If any of the rest of you wish to um, uh, present, that, that would, be, would be interesting. If, if his is the only uh, presentation, that's, that's also fine. We're, we're, we're anticipating that Ken Chapman, who is sort of the city's expert on the oil sands, will talk about the oil sands and the future. Uh, so that will be another presentation that evening. And then we'll have a particularly interesting group of people Skyping in, many from uh, Asia. It's a, it's, it's a convenient time. It's sort of a civilized time Sunday morning for them if they uh, Skype into our party on uh, Saturday night. So I've already had uh, a number of people uh, from uh, Asia who have indicated an interest. We don't know whether it will start at 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock. If we have a number of people who want to Skype in from uh, Europe, then it would make sense to start at 3. Um, anyway, that, those are the new developments on Future Day, March 1st. Uh, also, you may invite anyone that you wish to come, and as many people as you wish to, <laughs> to come. And they, they don't all have to be romantic partners or anything. You can ask parents, children, you know, any, any other people in your lives that you think it would make sense to bring here. That, that, that is also um, okay. I'm sure now Dr. Waugh has gotten quite tired of hearing me take his time away, so I'm going to stop doing that and turn the microphone over to Earl Waugh. Take it away. So, how are you all today? Good? I can assume that half the class has got the flu. And uh, I've probably got the tail end of it. I still have a cold, so I am, you know, struggling. But I will try to, you know, stay awake long enough to get through, you know, an hour and a half. Are we getting feedback? Okay. So today we have a very interesting issue to deal with, and that is in the larger sense, in what way science can assess and determine human behavior. And more specifically, behavior that is psychopathic or um, seems to deviate from the norm. And the venue that we're using to kick off this is to look at a book by Simon Baron Cohen. And the book itself is, um, I think, about four or five years old, right, Kim? And has had a, a very interesting impact in its environment. 
And uh, ever since we've had this course, we've actually dealt with this uh, book because it seems to have a particularly significant impact on some of the things that we talk about. So, um, I'm the one that's detailed to handle this. And so what we're going to do is to walk through some of the issues related to the science of evil on empathy and the origins of cruelty. So here are some of the issues that you're going to wrestle with as you try to figure out your own stance on where this is going. There are a number of ethical issues that are involved in trying to determine how it is that people do bad things. I'm sure your parents tried to figure out why you did bad things, and of course, they didn't want it traced back to genetic makeup at all. So the other thing, the other is interesting thing is that there's a number of issues related to the whole problem of evil and bad uh, behavior that becomes a critical problem for us today. Now, as we explore what we're going to talk about today, or we look at the situation that we live in, um, it's pretty clear that the legacy of Hitler sits over our shoulder. And from Simon's perspective, this is a critical issue. For him, the legacy of Hitler is absolutely critical to understand not only where we are now, but even to understand um, how science can tell us what's going on with the human mind. But there are a number of other things that you want to keep in mind, and that is how do you explain the fact that when you were a kid in school, you didn't feel badly about running in a herd. No, don't say, oh, I never did that. Yes, you did. I mean, I, you could see it in schoolyards now. You could see it in, in kindergarten. And the, the fact of the matter is that something about the human detects weakness in other humans and goes for it. And we say to ourselves, well, he's got a button that I can push and then the whole thing explodes. But that's not the only legacy that you have to live with. And of course, it's one of the legacies that my generation has left for you, and that is there have been in our history all kinds of killings that have gone on without any particular reason why. Oh, there's a, there are reasons that were manufactured for it. Of course, the witch hunts were one. But the other way in which children often were, shall we say, mishandled or manhandled in such a way that they became uh, totally uh, debilitated and ultimately died. So there has been in our history all kinds of killings of innocents. But then there's another dimension that you can read in the newspapers and that has something to do with stress. The argument is that in the current modern world that we live in, people are responding to stress in ways that are absolutely critical and problematic. And that what's happening in society is is something that's uh, um, kind of generic to the way that we're living. Now, um, if, you've, if you've read the newspapers in the last while, you can understand all of the issues of waterboarding and, and torture, and so you look at those and you think, well, I would never do that kind of thing. But these are real issues because we have to do it, and ordinary people like us do it. So we have to understand what it is in the human makeup that, that does this. Well, there's all kinds of things then that we have to deal with. So when we're in this course, it's kind of easy for us to forget about that side of human nature. And in fact, it's probably 
how should I put it? Easy for you to use technology as a way to get away from it. But the fact of the matter is within our society and even in the town, in the city of Edmonton, we have behavior that's very, very difficult for us to comprehend. So as I try to analyze Simon's book, I want to point out to you that I take a very personal interest in this particular perspective. So here's an outline of what I'm going to walk through with you in this particular section. And each of these issues has a bearing on the way in which I look at this whole issue. So one of the critical problems then is, what kind of bias do you bring to the, the whole issue? What kind of orientation do you bring to the whole issue? So right up front, I want to tell you about George Fluter. Have any of you ever been bullied? Yeah? Well, what's your reaction to the bully? I mean, after he's beaten you up or whatever he's done to you, what have you done? Have you, you say, oh, I love you, you know? What's your response? Utter contempt. Usually you might have um, kind of bewildered why asking to the bully, but usually just anger and rem uh, like reminiscing, ruminating type thing. Yeah, good. You start plotting your revenge. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think any, any logical person has at least one thought of getting back at them. Does anybody else want to make any uh, statements about this? Okay, well, let me tell you then a little bit about my story. You see, I grew up in, a, in Ontario in a small community, and I went to school in the first years of my life to a single room classroom. I know that sounds absolutely ancient, but the fact of the matter is that that's what we did. We had a one room schoolhouse in the little community and we had all the different grades lined up um, all the way along, okay? So as you might have expected, there were some conflicts between me and Georgie. And the reason these conflicts were in place was well, there were a number of reasons, but one is that I was the resident nerd in the school. And here is how it got me into trouble. The teacher decided that she was going to honor the best student in the class. So every week, what she did is she made what we call a shield, right? I should have brought one of them in. She made a shield. And every week on the back of the shield, she would write the name of a student who excelled that week and was regarded as the best student in the whole school. So every week, somebody would get their name put on the back. And then at the end of the school year, we had a kind of commencement exercise and the individual who had his name on the back of the shield the most, guess what? He got the shield. So in effect then, there was a, a patent way of understanding what was going on in the classroom. And Georgie hated it every minute of it. Uh, just as a footnote to that, I got three shields in the time I was in that school. Now, Georgie was what I would call a tough guy. He was built 
like a brick backhouse, and he was strong from pitching sheaves and hay. He was a tough farm kid that lived back the road from where we lived, and as you can see, probably I was a scrawny nothing as far as he was concerned. But it really bugged him that I was what I was. So as Georgie got a little bigger and I got a little bigger towards the end of the school year, <clears throat> Georgie decided that he was going to prove something to me. And so on the way back to my house, which was on the way to Georgie's place, Georgie would get me in the ditch and pound the you-know-what out of me. Now, I was raised in a, in a household that said, well, you know, if people hit you on one side of the cheek, turn the cheek and let them hit the other. No way, Jose. That, that ain't the way it feels at all. So Georgie beat me up on several occasions like this. And I had to deal with this in school. I had no empathy for George whatsoever. If you, wanted, if you want me to be truthful, I hated his guts. Well, after a couple of years of this, I let it be known to my friends and the other people that I was with that I wish George were dead. So I told my mother, you know, I hope that, you know, God does something to him because I'm really fed up at being bullied. Well, Georgie's family belonged to a church in Hamilton, which was about 15 miles away, and the road into town at that time was pretty hilly. And shortly after I said this, they were on their way to church. This is before seatbelts. They were on their way to church, and a car came up the wrong side of the road on, the other on the, one of these hills, and they hit head-on and George went right through the windshield and was dead in a second. Well, of course, they had a funeral and the whole class, the whole school went to the funeral. And everybody looked at me. What kind of power did I have to say that I wanted George dead? And he was dead. And what kind of guy was I that I hated him so much to say I wanted him dead? So you can see why when I come to this book and how it argues that if you, um, if you do an analysis of the way that the brain is constructed, you can come up with the whole notion of how evil can, can be. How I would find that to be really resentful. I would really resent that. So in effect then, if you've been bullied, why do you lack empathy for what happens to people? Because as I sat in church and listened to the funeral service, I had no empathy for George whatsoever. So in effect then, is there some problem with the way I'm made? Is there some difficulty with the way that I've been constructed? So have I got some kind of, from Simon's perspective, some kind of psychopathological system going on that really made me lose empathy? Well, from his perspective, this is the way we can explain evil. That is, we can do an analysis of the brain 
and we can come up with an analysis of why it is that people are the way they are and ultimately why there is a Hitler, why there is cruelty, and, why, and how all of this as a definition of the lack of empathy can grow and mount itself into the whole understanding of lack of empathy. So in his book, he goes through all of the categories of how we understand evil to come about. Now, any of you who have been raised in the Christian tradition will know that Christianity talks long and hard about sin. And so it sees sin and evil directly connected. On the other hand, it is also possible for you to see that this is a, um, re, uh, the result of the way in which the theological system has been constructed. That is, there's a devil and then there's a good guy and there's a bad guy. The devil is the bad guy and, and uh, God or Christ is the good guy. So the whole notion of evil and the presence of evil and why you would do such a thing as to hate somebody after being bullied. All of this from this perspective cannot explain for Simon why it is that we have evil. So there are a number of reasons why we can look at, but I'll just move on and here are some of the reasons that he gives. And in his book, we can see an analysis of what it is and why it is that he rests his entire thesis on the lack of empathy. So there are four conditions in people that exhibit lack of empathy. And these four conditions are psychopathy, narcissism, autism, and Asperger's syndrome. From his perspective, you can see this being expressed in their lives and having an, a, an immediate impact on the way in which their behavior is monitored and understood. So, from his perspective then, what we have to do is, is analyze the brain and the brain situation to look at the way in which lack of empathy is expressed in the brain. So his solution then is to look at the brains of those who, are, who have these conditions, especially the children that he deals with. He is a psychologist and a psychiatrist and he deals with autistic children. From his perspective then, if he can look at the, the brains of children and to understand what was going on with the lack of empathy, if he could trace that circuitry in the brain, then he could explain why some have lack of empathy and why others do not. And that means then he could explain why Hitler was the way he was and why we have other kinds of problems. So, um, Here's the brain, and as you can see, I don't, I'm not going to go through all of this key for you. There is one thing that I'll bring to your attention that just came across my desk a couple of days ago, and that is that they have now uh, decided that the place that organizes all of the um, material about your brain is in this, DMPFC, or MPFC, which is the dorsal or ventral medial prefrontal cortex. And that cortex is in the top. As you can see, it's right in this frontal area. So they've now found out that this is the only part of your brain that differs from a Macau monkey. So what humans have is a switching system here that's different than all the other animals. All right, so let's look at his argument. Taking his children and the MRIs that he has done and all of this, and basing it upon this empathy quotient questionnaire, 
he looks at all of these different regions of the brain and he sees these characteristics associated with them. So this um, medial prefrontal cortex comparing oneself with others. At any rate, when you look through all of these then, these are the, these are the areas that he thinks is important in the construction of an autistic child it is also important to understand because that is where you generate a lack of empathy. It's that evaluative system then that somehow or other um, makes a serious impact on the way in which you deal with things. So having done all of that, then here is his, his categories that he develops out of all of this material. And he sees then um, different categories that he uh, characterizes in various types. So, personality disorder borderline, which he calls type B, shows behavior of extremes, saying very destructive things to people, being angry for no particular reason, being destructive in how you deal with people. I don't know if you've read Marilyn Monroe's life, but Marilyn Monroe was like that. When she was in, um, perhaps you've read that when she was in Jasper, she made so, some people so angry there that they didn't want to see her again. She was just amazing. But Marilyn had a personality disorder. And so from his perspective then, she had type B. Then there's psychopath, there's the psychopath category, type P, he says, total detachment from others' feelings, cold, calculating, completely selfish, completely devoid of awareness of others and what the meaning might be. Then he has type N, total entitlement of self, using others, discarding those who are useless. His other categories, which he calls zero positive, are Asperger's. Asperger syndrome, avoidance of the social, very, very lonely, very, very patterning obsession. I interviewed a, an Asperger syndrome caregiver. He was a young man who was 20 to 21, and I was doing some research on caregiving, and I, and I came across him because he um, had a mother who was quite disabled and he was taking care of her. There was just the two of them in the household. So I met with him and I said, I'd be interested in your caregiving experience and, and what you think of being a caregiver. Well, he said, you know what? I'll be honest with you, I hate it. I hate my mother because she's demanding so much from me. I hate the situation I'm in because I'm, I don't have a, an opportunity to be normal. I'm alone all the time. I have no, no one to participate with. And I spend all my time thinking about what it might be like not to be looking after your mother. He said, I hate it. And I hate my mother because that's what I have to do for her. From Simon's perspective, autism reflects what he calls an underactivity in empathy. There are no words for the emotions. Hatred can't be defined and can't be stated. Extreme kinds of responses to others and even carrying out cruel and evil acts on others without feeling the least bit upset because of it. So autism for him, and this is where his research is, and so this is his strength of his thesis, Autism for him is precisely the place 
where we should look to understand how the human brain develops evil and how we can understand the whole uh, structure of, of sin and evil and bad to have come about. So I've thrown this in because this is an interesting idea. As you know, the terracotta warriors are in the mausoleum of the First Qin Empire outside Xi'an, China. The argument is that warfare, therefore, is part and parcel of the way humans relate to each other and part and parcel of the way in which large corporate and complex societies relate. So that, in effect, warfare is the way in which has been hardwired into our brains. So this hardwiring, then, is a way in which we see human behavior being carried out because it is part and parcel of the way social groups relate to each other. Well, if you go back to Simon's book, here is the basis, then, of his evidence for a circuitry in the brain that carries on the lack of empathy. He goes, first of all, to the Maori people in New Zealand. If you've been to New Zealand, or if you've seen the New Zealand um, black, the New Zealand blacks, they have this kind of uh, rugby team, right? They have this kind of war-like yell, and it, it, it scares everybody on the sidelines. Well, the reason for that is because the warrior tradition in New Zealand was so evident that when people first went to New Zealand, they said, look, there is something genetic about the way in which New Zealanders, the traditional people <clears throat> of New Zealand, um, express this. So therefore, he argues, Simon argues, that this aggressiveness gene is present in um, New Zealand, and you can find it in other peoples in the world. The second evidence that he uses for his argument is that emotional recognition is a genetic construct. That is, the way in which we relate to each other, the way in which we um, set up relationships, the way in which we express emotions like love or hate or things like that, all of these things are part and parcel of a genetic construct. And so he has, we, I have here written down the two kinds of um, genetic constructs that are accorded for this uh, <clears throat> this co construct, and it is serotonin, transporter, and arginine, russopressin, receptor. So both of these are involved, he argues, in the autism and in autism-linked activity. Well, <clears throat> let's back up for a minute and see what we can say about this. First of all, is it possible to develop empathy? Is it possible to move beyond the fact that you lack empathy for someone and then eventually come to like them or to embrace them? In other words, is, does relationships always stay still? So the evidence is no, that in fact, you can develop empathy. Whether you can develop empathy with autistic children is another issue. But it is, in fact, the case that ordinary people can come to terms with their enemy. So, in effect, then, empathy is something that can be developed. So another issue is, well, if we all didn't have empathy, you know, is that bad? 
So if, we, if none of us have it, and we all don't care about what happens to each other, is that really, really bad? So another issue that is that's often raised in the literature is, well, if individuals have this lack of empathy, can states do the same thing? In other words, can states say, well, it doesn't matter what this state says, we are going to you know, send the, the, the armies against them. So is it possible then for a state to be empathetic and to say, well, look, we won't do it this time? So for example, if you ban the death penalty, is that an expression of empathy? Well, the other issue that you have to, to face is, well, is empathy dangerous? Well, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know whether if somebody just says, oh my goodness, um, every time uh, you walk out the door ahead of a woman and you say, oh my goodness, I'm so very sorry I walked out ahead of you. I should have let you go out the door first. I, I should have been aware of, of you and I should have, have given you the, the first place in all of this. Can you be super empathetic to the point where it's ridiculous? And I think so. So the question is, even if circuitry explains the lack of empathy, can this transmute into this whole larger category of evil? So because you lack empathy, does that for you mean that you are evil? Well, there's a new study out that I wanted to bring to your attention. <clears throat> when these people adapted a self-image and they imagined themselves and they imagined others while viewing bodily injury. So, for example, if you saw somebody, you know, they were driving a nail into his hand, and you responded to that, how were you, you going to respond to that? And you can see that their low, medium, and high uh, psychopathological people who responded differently. So here's a picture of their brain under the MRI when they were presented with this option of, of this individual uh, doing some kind of bad thing to somebody else and their response to it. So you can see from the green, they imagined yourself was always present. But you look at the purple and you can see the low, well, for some time, you know, they, they showed significant concern about others, but then the medium individual and, of course, the high psychopathological patient, he showed absolutely no interest whatsoever, no empathy whatsoever. And so by the time you get to the center of the graph, you see that there's very little empathy there whatsoever. So the argument from that is then that self-imagining how you're going to deal with this and, and imagining others does have a correlation to psychopathological states. So from one perspective then, this argument that Simon is making has some kind of validity among people who have some kind of psychopathological condition. But does that argue then that all um, autistic children and all people who lack empathy are subject to the same kind of circuitry problem? And I think not. So in order to point out to you that there are other ways of understanding this than what Simon has 
suggested, I'm bringing to you some other options. For example, if you look at Frankfurter's book, Frankfurter argues that even the definition of evil and even ritual activities based on it is really socially conditioned. It's really based on individual cultures and individual civilizations. It is not a universal characteristic and it is not part and parcel of what you find everywhere. So there is no such thing as an evil incarnate. Moreover, as you um, look at the social construction of evil, you can see that it has religious dimensions, it's got political dimensions, it's got social dimensions, and all of those things mean that it's not accepted universally. And finally, there is no notion of cruelty that is universal. In fact, it may be constructed locally. And let me give you an example. In the old days in the North, the Inuit often took their aged people to islands and left them there. Now, what they did was, if the, if the elderly could no longer chew the skins, of the animals that they caught, if their teeth were rotted and they could no longer chew the skins to make them soft, that meant that they had no practical purpose in the community any longer. And from, from the social perspective of the Inuit then, they couldn't afford to feed another person if they couldn't contribute to the overall benefit of the group because of the scarcity of food. So the elderly, when they no longer could chew the skins and no longer could provide hunting or cooking or any of those activities, the elderly would say to their sons and their daughters, I want to go to the island. And so they would be taken to a remote island and they would be left there to die. Is that cruel? How many of you think that's cruel? Yeah? Yeah? Is that a universal thing? I don't think so. Because from their cultural perspective, right? From their cultural perspective, this is the way they understood the end of life to come. So maybe the whole understanding of what is evil is socially constructed in various cultures in various ways. And if that's the case then, we cannot assume that all definitions of evil are going to be universally accepted. And you can see here that the class was split on whether or not that was an evil thing to have done. So in effect then, um, evil and utilizing the whole argument from autism for uh, the expression of evil has some dubious aspects to it. Now, in his book, there are a number of things that you should note. One of all, he, he, one of the things is that he calls evil a realm. Is it a realm? Do you belong to an evil realm? I know that, which president was it called the Soviet Union um, the evil kingdom? Was it the evil kingdom? I mean, there was one time when... Um, See, I can't remember which president it was. Reagan, I think. Was it Reagan? Yeah. Uh, axis of evil. Axis of evil. Yeah, that's right. It was the axis of evil. Now we're there in the Olympics. How times change, huh? So the definition of evil, however, is really in the hands of authorities. 
It's not you who decides what is evil. It's really in the hands of the people that say this is evil and this is what we will de determine evil to be. So the last thing I want to talk about, what role does conspiracy play in the meaning of evil? So are we complicit in it? If, if the state does evil, are you complicit in that? Does that mean you have some guilt because the state is doing evil things? So if you, were, if you had been alive um, back in the, uh, the sit-ins around Washington and Chicago in the 60s, there were a number of people who were very much opposed to Vietnam. And the whole United States, you know, exploded in people who were anti-Vietnam. And the, the arguments that went on there were incredible. I mean, I was in Chicago at the time doing my doctoral work, and it was fascinating. So does that mean then, because I didn't go out and walk on the anti-Vietnam War um, platform and I didn't go out and, and march and I, you know, I didn't do any of that kind of thing. Does that mean I was complicit in the, the deaths of the Vietnamese that came because uh, the United States was involved in Vietnam? So these are issues then that means that the larger whole idea of, of evil is something that has greater ramifications and the inter interpretation of that is significant. Well, here's a couple of things that tell us about autism, which is the central feature of Simon Baron Cohen's argument, and that is that autism is a kind of continuing condition of the brain. But in fact, this recent study in 2013 said, says that in fact, children can outgrow autistic characteristics. And that might mean then that the circuitry argument is much more flimsy than it might have seen otherwise. And finally, the argument from Haliner and his colleagues was that in fact, decision making is much more complex than any concept of circuitry that we have at the moment. So here's a few other critiques of Simon Baron Cohen's thesis. One of them I want to raise for you is, can a theory in one area of scientific knowledge necessarily apply in others? So is it possible then to argue that if we discover some kind of scientific principle in one area of science, we should necessarily think that that applies across the whole scan of scientific theory? And that raises a number of fundamental issues. So finally, let me end off my discussion by pointing out some of the issues that we have talked about. Cultural determinants make it impossible to disengage the notion of evil from Western cultural experience. So even when you're talking about Hitler, you're really talking about the context of ethical theory within Western consciousness and within Western civilization. You're really talking about a cultural experience that is soaked in Christian theological understandings. And that means then that the whole notion of evil is really, that he uses, is really based in a Western experience and is not necessarily universal. So finally, variables in human mind are so great that isolating one circuitly hardly explains it all. All right, so there's all kinds of things there to talk about. So questions, comments? 
Um, so my first question was how you discussed that this whole thinking from Mr. Cohen was um, based off a Western Christian viewpoint. And for that reason, uh, you said that perhaps we, perhaps maybe um, people don't view what we view as evil as necessarily being evil to them also. And I was just thinking that like, in terms of Hitler, I just can't see how there would be any possible culture in the world that would see his actions as anything else than evil. I feel like there must be some fundamental things that we humans just see as being so wrong that regardless of like your background or your history, it, it can't be anything other than evil. And like no matter what your background, it won't shape your perspective of it into anything else. So I guess my question is, um, where exactly are people, uh, where else would people get their different perspectives on the fundamental evil? Well, okay, so you raise a number of issues in that query. Um, first of all, um, Simon's, Simon's use of Hitler as a kind of norm for evil is really time-bound. I mean, it, um, it doesn't have a universal kind of context because before Hitler came along, of course, there were other kinds of evil and there were other kinds of bad things that happened, but they weren't they weren't classified as a kind of personified evil. So in effect, we look back on the Hitler era now and we impose upon Hitler and what he did as the ultimate evil. But I don't see that this ultimate evil um, was never carried out in any other society in the world. We know that it was. I mean, there, there are periods in Chinese history when there was incredible evil things carried out in the name of the emperor. And yet somehow or other, for, for us, it is Hitler that has been the quintessential expression of evil. Now, why is that? So I suspect it's part of the way in which we have constructed the Hitler period and the way in which we view these events now. If, if we look at it from a much larger kind of cultural environment, um, Hitler's acts, why they're heinous, are not extraordinary in human experience. So therefore, what I have the most difficulty with in, in Simon's understanding is that the Hitler model defines humanness in terms of evil. I'm not suggesting that there is not evil, but I am not suggesting that, what, but what I am suggesting is that evil itself cannot be, um, accorded a universal value of one kind of image, one kind of person, one kind of understanding. I just think that the whole notion of evil is, is constructed mainly around what we learn in, in our homes, what we learn at school, and what our culture defines evil to be. And I suspect for example, that, you know, if we ever have Star Wars, there will be evil things that we do to other planets and other peoples and other things, and that we will, we will think that they're necessary for humans to survive, right? I mean, it, it, it will be a kind of uh, definition of, of evil that is 
only to the losers. So I'm very suspicious about claims that this is the ultimate expression of evil. And that's the reason why I'm suspicious of it. There's one other thing that I would mention in this regard. Even if you grant that there is evil in the sense that Simon wants to state there is, even if you accept that Hitler defines that um, extreme evil, how does that relate to autism? And how does that relate to the notion of lack of empathy? Is it possible to be evil and to never um, determine that you are evil at all? In other words, can you have an evil mind that you are totally scheming things and you never do it yourself? You just, you just put things in the way so that it so that something happens to someone that is absolutely evil. Now, uh, just, just one last point. Some of my classmates thought I was evil. Some of my classmates thought that there was something, how would I say it, fishy <laughs> about me when I made this kind of declaration and then, <clears throat> you know, a, a week later, George was dead. I don't think so, but a lot of my classmates thought so. Okay, another one. <clears throat> I was just going to say that you were kind of asking the question there in your second point, uh, whether someone who lacks empathy can kind of um, <clears throat> refrain from doing evil. Uh, I think I think they're two separate things because I, I just, every time uh, psychopathy is brought up in any of um, my psychology courses or anything, it's, I remember an article that I read about um, the flip side of psychopathics and just, um, it was like uh, an article uh, kind of, I think it was four or five individuals that were successful, positive people, but they didn't have empathy. Uh, they had successful careers in um, the financial markets. They were especially good at that. I can't remember the other occupations, but basically they, they were able to uh, separate um, emotions from their work and it just came naturally f for them. And, and I think it, it depends how you're raised. Um, I don't think it's entirely circuitry because these people were, they did have the circuitry if, if that's what it's based on mm -hmm. to not have empathy, but they were still able to uh, lead successful lives with families. And um, so I think, I think it must have to do with a lot with development rather than just circuitry. I don't know if that's what Cohen's arguing, but um, is he saying it's only circuitry? Well, um, what, he's, what he's trying to argue is that, that autistic children um, betray this kind of lack of empathy. I don't know if you know about autistic children, but they, they are notorious for not, you know, caring for what's happening to the, to the guy next door. I mean, they could be sitting with another child and that child may, let's say, the scissors have fallen in, into his hand and he's screaming and the autistic child could to just sit there and say, well, so what, you know? So there's a kind of disconnect between the emotional involvement of the child with uh, an individual that's clearly in some kind of trauma and, and needs help. The autistic child won't respond to that, that especially the, the severely autistic child. And, and he will just go on and do his own playing and he won't pay any attention to what's going on with the child. So from, from Simon's work in, in child psychology then, he is arguing that on the basis of that, that this kind of lack of ability is the basis then for how we come to experience evil. It is that distancing it's the distancing of the emotional person from someone who is clearly having pain and clearly suffering. From his perspective, that lack of engagement with a person that is suffering is a clear indication that there's a, something wrong with the circuitry in the brain. Now,
There are a number of issues here, okay? So let me unpack a few of them. The first one is what we would call how, how we relate to each other in an, in an emotional environment. As we're sitting here, we are, you know, we are not personally engaged in any kind of conflictual situation. At least not yet, if I say something really radical. But, but we're not in any kind of conflicted situation. And so uh, we sit in what I would call an emotional environment. That is, there's a kind of uh, presence that each of us have and we accept each presence and it is part and parcel of the way we relate to each other. But one of the problems is, and, and, and we see this now with youngsters and their, their iPhones, right? They, they have difficulty relating to children because they're totally engrossed in, in their iPhone. And so we see this kind of distancing becoming part of our culture. The, the way in which we treat individuals with a kind of indifference is mediated through the cell phone. So the real issue for me in cell phone culture is what is it doing to us emotionally? And, and I think one of the things that I agree with Simon Baron Cohen on this issue is that this emotional understanding that we have with each other is somehow or other broken um, by the way that autistic children respond to the world. So is it possible then that by distancing ourselves, we are, so to speak, creating brains that want that kind of emotional distance, that, that find it in, they, they find it unable to, to identify with someone else's pain? Will it come to a point when your kids find it much more interesting to look at an iPad than to engage in any kind of play with another individual? So is this a cultural construction or is it a wiring construction? Now some people on both sides of this scientific argument say that this is the way that our brains are changing. So that we are, in effect, distancing ourselves and that the tool we use to distance ourselves is electronics and technology. So in the movie Her, if you believe the action there, and it, it's interesting that the movie, as of this point, as of today, has received a lot of praise. The idea would be that the machines are better at empathy, at feeling, at, at helping you your well-being, that they are smarter and therefore they're able to figure out what your emotional needs are and can satisfy it better than another human being could. So is it possible then that we're just sort of part way along a path that right now machines make us more distant from each other because this ideal point of you know machines understanding human relationships better than, better than humans. We haven't reached that. But when we do, the ideal friend reliably will always be in the tablet or iPhone. <laughs> what you access there will reliably, testably, you, you can take any measure of empathy and you know good friendliness and that operating system will be better than a, than a human being. That's scary in its, in its own way. I mean, it's you know, evil in its own way, kind of, right? No, but, uh, but for me, what is important about that is that uh, the machine is predictable. Yes. Right? We know how the machine is going to act because it has been properly, uh, you know, the, it's been properly set up. It doesn't have the quirks that humans 
have that can, you know, change their mind in the middle of something. So a yeah. machine, from my perspective, what's really great about the machine is that it's, you know what it's going to do. It's been programmed to do that. So uh -huh. there's going to be no surprises. Yeah, and, and then when we learn that it, the problem with relationships with machines then is that they're too predictable, then they will learn what kind of unpredictability is particularly pleasing, you know, what kind of surprises human beings like. And then they'll be better at that unpredictability and the pleasant surprises than uh, uh, human beings are. Well, I, I think that's <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, the, the fact is that the machines now you know, what we've got is Google trying to figure out what you're going to buy next month. Yes. And so all of the machines are doing is sitting there to find out what your patterns are. So the machine right. now is trying to fi figure out what it is that you're going to buy next month. So if you, you know, if you take that image and you build on it, then you can see that um, what the machine will do is try to figure out all your predictabilities. Right. But there will be moments when you won't do what the machine predicts, yeah. right? So, you know, one technology-related thing that we all have strong feelings about is the human being Steve Jobs. I mean, we, we all, we, we've watched things that he's done, things that he's said. We, we, we have particular feelings about that. But when you look at the kind of guy he was, some basic things come out, and they're neither right nor wrong. They're kind of mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, this definition of, of evil you've been talking about. He um, went from one group of friends to the next as his career evolved and sort of got rid of, not by killing them, but just by, by not interacting with them in, anymore, the people who had helped him up to a certain point, but mm -hmm. didn't look like they would be useful for the future. He, he just sort of discarded those friends, made new ones, and in a, in a very callous way. I mean, he, he didn't make sure that these friends he was, um, separating from himself were well looked after, he just moved on. Now, is that something that we think is the way, way of the future? A, a lot of people, probably a lot of successful people are like that, with their friends, with their wives, uh, with their spouses, you know, that they, they feel life sort of, you know, evolves like that. It's chapter one and certain characters are valid in chapter one that just don't fit at all in chapter two. And, and so that, that was a very strong characteristic of his life. Yes, it was. Yeah, and, and, and so um, there, there are many other things like that. If you look at the German people when, you know, Hitler was in charge, before that, how did they compare to us? Were they intrinsically more evil than the people sitting in this room before he came to power? I don't think so. Mm -mm. They were pretty much like us. They had mundane concerns. They got up in the morning. They wanted breakfast. You know, they wanted to be entertained. They, they wanted all the same things that we w wanted. And then he came to power and they began doing things that we regard as uh, evil. But who's to say? <laughs> If a, a character like that became the, uh, in, in, in power, it's, it's hard to imagine in this obscure part of northern Canada, but, you know, if, if suddenly there, we were part of a totalitarian regime, would we resist the things that, that the German people did not resist? Uh, it's, it's, it's honestly hard to know. Human uh, behavior is more changeable and malleable, and, and you know, we, we think that we've never compromised on these things, but it's easy to say that because we, we know that we're not going to have to, you know? So, so any thoughts? Mm -hmm. well, I was just going to say about like Hitler, 
people thought that he was a hero in Germany because Germany was under like um, after the first world war they were under like depression and everything and he was the only one who was able to radically thought on um, how to bring Germany up so maybe that's why Germ the German people followed him and they didn't really know what was happening with um, all the Jews so maybe that's why they followed him so I was gonna say I was gonna ask like if being um, like being disconnected um, empathically right is a basis of evil um, aren't that doesn't that kind of like um, stop progress because people um, people who react emotionally seem to like kind of die like faster compared to people who think logically and separate themselves from emotions so yeah would that stop progress in like in any sense whatsoever mm. well one of the things that i've had to wrestle with is whether the it is the state that's evil whether people can be evil you know i mean it's quite easy to say that uh that Hitler was evil, but and in fact, wasn't the, wasn't the state that, that acquiesced in what he said about what had to be done? Isn't it the, isn't the state apparatus that really supported him and, and provided him the, the kind of um, orientation that would allow him to kill all the Jews and all the gypsies and whoever else he wanted to kill? So. The, the fact of the matter is, he, it was a state apparatus that, was, that supported him, that created this kind of incredible evil that we have. I'm, I'm rather reluctant to use evil as, it, as this kind of word that we use and attach it to, to a person, because I think people are much more nuanced than that. And so that, it's, for me, it's very difficult to say even that George was evil. You know, I, I said at the time he was evil. You know, I, I hated his guts. But in retrospect, you know, he may have had some reason for being, for hating me. I mean, I was that bloody nerd, right? That was always acing the, the exams, that was always getting the shields, that was always, you know, acing everything and he just said you know the hell with this i i don't like this guy i'm gonna you know i'm gonna beat him up so maybe there's reasons for why george was like he is and in my old age i'm able to say well i don't think george was evil the way i said he was evil you know um, and and i maybe i would use the term you know he's a rotten egg now to say what i think he was but you know, there's another aspect of this, and that is if you go to divorce court, <laughs> you hear all of these people saying, you know, this, is, this guy is terrible, and he's, a, he's rotten, and he's, a, he's evil, and, you know, you get this, this husband and wife and divorce thing go on. But, you know, that's all rhetoric. <laughs> and, and, and when you cut away all of that kind of rhetoric, you know, what it is is that they... They don't see each other the same way that they did, did, you know, 15 years ago or 10 years ago or whatever. So, in effect, people have changed. People change, and and so um, maybe what one of the reasons why we think it's it's evil is because of the change. We just can't. We we do have a kind of constructed way of dealing with life, and if things are outside of that, maybe we feel that that's evil. Maybe it's bad. So I think we have an, an innate kind of feeling about it, about being, uh, about change. And it's perhaps one of the things that um, we find most interesting about what's happening now in our culture. The change is acceptable to some people, but to others it's not. So any other questions? How are we for time? We've got a few minutes, huh? So um, I, d I don't really want to say, I, I suppose just I have a different viewpoint on it, but I struggle with the idea of completely believing that the state must be evil 
if they are led by an evil leader. I feel that fundamentally, when it comes down to it, it's, it's really only that one person who is truly evil. And he has just, this is going back to the zero empathy thing, he has completely disregarded the consequences of what might happen if he gains a following. Like, I don't believe at any point Hitler really cared what would happen to the majority of uh, regular German citizens. I don't think he thought that far into the war to even consider what would happen to citizens if the war did and it, it certainly did get to the home front in Germany. I don't think he thought that far ahead. So what I'm trying to say is, I believe it's really only at the core of it that Hitler was evil and he just so happened to be able to prey on the weakness of other humans uh, being the regular German citizens. I don't feel that, at least for the majority of the regular German citizens in their core, I don't think they were super evil. I think if you gave them a uh, black and white decision and you sat them down in a room and gave a German citizen a rifle and sat him in a room with just one Jewish citizen, and if you gave the German citizen a choice to somehow make it seem that he had killed the Jewish citizen, and say that it happened, but it didn't. I feel that at the core of it, a regular human being would step back from all this and just say, no, I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm on that level of the extremity of the leader. And I feel like you can say that to an extent the state has been brainwashed, I suppose. And that's the thing. It's just that they've been brainwashed by all these external forces. And I feel that only the leader is the truly evil person and that the little followers still retain this level of humanity because it takes someone as radical as the leader to be that evil to lead others. And I feel that anyone who follows, they're followers because they don't have that radicalness. You know, Otherwise, they would be the leader. So I feel like because of that, I don't think the state can possibly have the same level of evil as the leader. Your colleagues want to talk about that. Uh... I was going to say about that, like um, how regular people would step back, right? Um, there was the like, Stanley Milner um, experiment where, like, yeah, well, Milner, yeah, sorry, yeah, um, where like um, they do the electric shock thing, and then there's a figure of authority, right? And then obviously he's not evil, but like they just follow what the authority says and they just shock the person until like it's like until the other person would die. And then they would hear um, a recording screaming, but then they still do it, right? So in a sense, I don't think Hitler's like innately evil. It's just it's the external forces too. I mean like um, you could say like power corrupted him as most people was, right? Because before he rose to power, he wrote a bunch of stuff that um, he really cared about Germany, right? He, he really cared that um, Germany should rise back up to power where they were before World War I. So, like, they want to be respected. So, yeah. Excuse me, this question might sound weird. Oh, I just have a hard time considering Baron Cohen's position in the first place. I mean, uh, he, he, t he tries to focus a lot on uh, genetics, like brain circuitry, uh, physical hardware that all humans have. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's any way of judging whether someone can be evil or not. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I, my, my stance is that uh, everyone can have can have evil thoughts, I guess. Even the best, even the best people in the world um, can have evil thoughts, and I think it's maybe innately in the human nature to be evil sometimes. And I think you can't generalize a population just because they have this certain brain circuitry that they necessarily will be evil and lack the ability to, to be good in society. Um, 
So I guess so. Uh, could you could you explain sort of where Baron Cohen is coming from? I understand he's a, a psychologist who works with autism, but the, his general statement about this um, how circuitry can uh, can be evil, like, I, I just don't really I, I can't get that in my head. Well, neither can I, <laughs> because. Frankly, what, what you're doing is imposing a circuitry model on the brain that you think is fixed. I don't think we know enough about the circuitry in the brain to be able to clearly define what circuitry might mean. I'm greatly exercised by the use of the word circuit because it comes you know, very close to the kind of circuitry that we talk about in a laptop. You know, in other words, it's fixed and and, and it's always there and it always works that way. That, that's not right. That's not the way the human brain works. And, and the, the very fact that children who are autistic can eventually uh, get beyond it means that the brain works around that. And, and ultimately, whatever this circuitry he's talking about is not the circuitry that is as firm as he tries to make it out to be. So uh, I'm... I'm and then to move from that argument to the argument that this is the basis of evil is, is just absolutely mind-boggling. I mean, I, I find that intellectually to be very difficult to even grasp, let alone to understand. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, the, while it... You know what it sounds to me like? It, it, the problem is that Western, Western culture has never yet been able to grapple with the presence of that kind of evil. You know, how are we going to explain it? Why do we have to explain it? Because theologically Christians have set up this notion of the devil and have set up this idea that there's great sin in the world and there's great evil in the world. So this is a kind of theological issue that we're wrestling with. I, the whole argument about evil you know, being kind of the ultimate thing seems to me to, to come back to a kind of uh, uh, Christian consciousness about the presence of what is bad. So that's why I'm totally unconvinced by his argument. And I don't find that same kind of thing in any other culture. For example, well, let's step back for a minute. How many, how many women in the world do you know that are evil? Can you give me one example of a woman in history who is w evil incarnate? Carla Homoka. Huh? Carla Homoka. Oh, Carla Homoka. Hmm. Would you all agree? She, she certainly did evil things. Yes, yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah. You know, there, there, there's another thing that if you accept that the circuitry of the brain relates to evil yeah. and is variable genetically between people, so like some of these guys have more evil circuitry than others yeah. genetically, you know, then, then it becomes a whole other kind of source of uh, prejudice mm -hmm. than, that, that certain people are, you know, inherently evil. Seems to me that's a very evil idea. Well, it is. But for me, you know, for example, the autistic child is condemned, in my view, by uh, Baron Cohen's analysis. I, I think it's, uh, it's shocking. Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we're okay. out of time. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Okay. We're an excellent session.